Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, kenichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moi muli wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos, hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you're joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends, your kids' teachers, principals, and librarians about the show. And also, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Podbean, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Monica Berg. She's here to celebrate the gift of being different. Before we invite Monica into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Latkes for Santa Claus, Janie Emmaus' debut picture book, illustrated by the amazing Brian Langdo. It was a finalist in the 2022 International Book Awards. In this humorous and endearing story, blending both Christmas and Hanukkah, a little girl and her stepbrother compete to leave Santa the best treats ever. It's a joyful, engaging read, perfect for culturally blended families and delightful for all readers. The playful rhymes will keep kids giggling in Janie's family vodka recipe, which is included at the end of the book, is to die for. Watch for Janie's next blended holiday book, Easter Eggs and Matzo Ball, coming in 2023. Get your copy today, Latkes for Santa Claus by Janie Emmaus. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by How Can We Be Kind, a beautiful picture book by Janet Hoffman. This special book asks children a simple question, how can we be kind? The answer? By learning from the animal kingdom. Animals demonstrate kindness and empathy towards each other. And care and compassion can be seen throughout the natural world. This book shows children the ways that they can be kind, just like their animal friends are to each other, while at the same time teaching them about the magic and the beauty of the natural world. They can learn to be welcoming like capybaras who let other animals sit on top of them while they wallow in the mud. Or maybe they want to be like dolphins who guide other species to their destinations. With beautiful illustrations from Darla Okada, this beautiful picture book will enchant and entertain children time and time again. Get your copy today, How Can We Be Kind? Wisdom from the Animal Kingdom by Janet Hoffman. Join us right now from beautiful New York City. Our guest is here today to help us uh, celebrate Dyslexia Awareness Month and also to celebrate her brand new picture book. It's called The Gift of Being Different. Please welcome to the show, Monica Berg. Hey, Monica, how are you? I'm good. Good, thank you. Uh, This seems like a really important book, The the Gift of Being Different. there's so many ways that we're different. Tell us a little bit about this book and um, who it's inspired by. Uh, well, it's inspired by my youngest. I have four kids. Um, her name's Abigail, and she was struggling in school in the first grade, second grade. She couldn't read. She couldn't write very well. Um, she was suffering in math as well, and she was starting to. It was starting to affect her self-esteem and we were really puzzled at first the teachers were as well because she was she's very intelligent and she was able to do things well beyond other kids in her class in terms of complex thinking and solving problems but reading she really just couldn't grasp so we had her tested and they diagnosed her with dyslexia and it's really a story about her journey and being able to recognize that her difference um, or it's known as a disability, although I have problems with that word mm-hmm. because of all, of all that comes along with it, but that it's not an inability. And we started to reframe it for her. That's really a superpower. And, um, and it, and you see that unfold for her, how she starts to recognize that, you know, these things that she can do specific to dyslexia, many people cannot. And there are amazing, talented, creative people, successful people in the world that have dyslexia. So she started to really embrace it to the point where, 
the next day after she um, she finally came to terms with it, she went around to everybody saying, I have a superpower. It's dyslexia. What's yours? That's cool. We've talked a lot about dyslexia, about what it is and what it isn't here in the podcast. It's interesting that kids who have or are challenged by dyslexia have this label of being disabled or having a learning disability. From the different experts that I've talked to, the disability lands more with our English language than it does with kids. We have 24 letters in our alphabet, but we have 46 or 48 sounds that those letters represent. And, you know, we teach our kids, well, here are the rules to grammar, here are the rules to reading. And by the way, those rules don't always count. There are all these different exceptions. And that a kid doesn't, you know, kind of grasp immediately that there are exceptions um, shouldn't be labeled as a disability, I don't think. Well, here's the thing. I think um, I think the problem is how we understand that word to be, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different connotations that go along with it. And usually it's something that the person, again, is in, it's an inability to do what everybody else can do. I think we need to redefine what disability is. I think that, and I, I don't like labels full stop, but Children who have dyslexia, they need to be identified in the school system so that they can get the proper, sorry, so they can get the proper help that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, and often that, that's the, that's the issue, right? I, I was fortunate that Abigail was going to a school that really had this great infrastructure, was able to recognize this, send us to a professional, and then she was able to get that diagnosis. So then she could go to a school that really knows how to teach children with dyslexia. There's there's a special program, there's a special way. And once she went to that school at the beginning of third grade, she learned to read within three months mm-hmm. with proficiency. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I call it a difference. I call it a superpower because I don't want the stigma of any label. Um, you know, what what is, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, the problem is that we're trying to teach everybody in the same way, mm-hmm. like a cookie cutter version. We're all so different. We are nuanced, we're complex, we're going to see things differently, we're going to understand them differently. Sometimes people need to see things in pictures and images to learn. Some people are audio learners. So I, I think that, and that's part of what we're doing with this book is to really bring attention and awareness to that. Um, it's not wrong, it's just different. Exactly, exactly. And you just hit on something that we've talked about a lot here in the podcast that we all learn differently. And the, the, hopefully our schools will evolve to the point where we're recognizing that and developing strategies so that we can teach kids to reach their full potential and not just fit into uh, a cookie cutter. Yeah, to a, a norm. And by the way, Let's think about this. If we really want to raise healthy adults, right? We want them to be confident, self-sufficient, independent. Then we need to make sure that these formidable years are not creating damage or scars or insecurities or inadequacy. Those kinds of feelings that really stop people from living their best lives. I remember, you know, I had a fourth grade teacher, a math teacher who was horrible. Like he was, he would really picked on me. And I, I don't think he liked being a teacher, but, um, I know that for years, you know, even now I don't like math, but for years it affected me in every area academically. I didn't think I was that intelligent until I realized I was. And I started to actually utilize all of my own talents, right? But it took me fighting for myself to really get there. And I think that, um, again, part of what we want to do with this book, and it's it's part of a 10-book uh, series, it's on being, is to really talk about social issues um, cultural issues, different stigmas we have, different differences, whether it's Down syndrome or autism. Um, we have a book on homelessness coming up. And I think that just to talk about these things and say, hey, what's the remedy? The remedy is empathy, kindness, compassion, curiosity, removing fear, right? I think that often we fear the things that are different. So we say, oh, I, that's over there, and this is normal, and I'm over here. Mm-hmm. So, and that's, yeah, 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 that's so important to help our kids see that we are all part of one beautiful human family. Yes, and a lot of people say, oh, well, I realize after I read the book, this is not just for kids with learning differences. This is for typical children so they can learn to have empathy and compassion for people who things might not come out as easily uh, academically, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
That's one of the things we love about books is that they can be mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors, letting kids see themselves portrayed positively in books, letting kids look in and see kids that they consider different and see that they are really like us, and then books allowing kids to come together from, from different cultures, different abilities. Um, what I, I know that this particular book was inspired by your daughter, but the series, did you write this book and then decide, oh, there are so many other things that I want to address, or did you have a burning desire to address all those other topics and decided to start with your daughter's story? Well, I'm a storyteller. I learn through stories. I think that everybody really does. Um, and I, this is my first children's book. I've written two other books. Um, one is called Fear is Not an Option. The other one is called Rethink Love. So I, I love helping people connect the dots. And, um, and once we wrote this story, funnily enough, and this always happens to me, it happened with my first book. This was not supposed to be the first one in the series. The first book is what is going to be the third book. And then, as I was writing that book, this situation with Abigail arose, and then we realized that, wow, this is the first book. Um, so basically, it's her childhood, it's my childhood, it's stories and experiences um, that we talk about and that we share and that we create a new story around. So it just became very like, oh, you know, this is next, and we have to talk about that and talk about this. Like, she has a cousin who is autistic, and so she's inspired us um, in a very big way. My second son was born with Down syndrome. So of course I'm inspired by him. I'm inspired by everybody, but I think especially my children have always inspired me to want to be better. And, um, and I really learned from them. So this is kind of natural for me to put it into a storybook now. Yeah. Yeah. How big of a challenge was it going from writing a book for adults where you can have 50, 60, 70,000 words to use to inspire adults to writing a children's book where you can only use five or 600 words? I have to say it was quite liberating because um, I love the marriage between relying on the illustrations to tell part of the story that really, because I learn in pictures also more than words. I'm a very visual learner. And I love that, like, oh, I could say this, but it would be so much better if I just showed it. So I really enjoyed that process, and I found the most phenomenal, talented illustrator who, believe it or not, lives in Italy, and she doesn't really speak English very well, but we communicate so perfectly. And again, it's that that balance, that beauty of word and picture mm -hmm. that um, when it's done right, it's done, it's beautiful. Yeah. Other than helping kids understand that their difference, be it dyslexia or autism or Down syndrome, is a gift. What else do you want parents and families to know about dyslexia and how they can best advocate for their kids? So I think that um, there's one more step I'd like to talk about because it's hard to get any diagnosis and then, wow, it's a gift, right? There's a process that kind of occurs. So I think for parents, and I've, I had somebody come to me recently and they said, you know, three of all three of her children are in some kind of program or they need assistance, whether it's in school or after school. Uh, and they have a very, they're all a variety of different um, issues. And she asked them the question, you know, should I tell them what it is? And I said, well, it's very specific to each child. And also, are they aware that they're struggling? You know, if they're getting all this extra help, do they feel different? Do they feel bad about themselves? I think that, you know, if they're aware of it and you're not talking about it, then somehow the feedback that they're getting is that it's not okay or there's something wrong with this and we're not discussing it. So I think the first is to be able to approach everything with curiosity instead of fear and have that openness in conversation. In terms of dyslexia, what I did, and I think that, um, and it's in the book as well, that process, but I got super curious about it. I really wanted to understand how Abigail learned and how she um how she saw words and letters. And so I did research and I became informed. And then when I was ready to have this conversation with her about her diagnosis, I got very specific examples of what it must be like for her in her brain. And when I pulled out this list, she said, wow, yes, I do that. Yes, I see it that way. Yes, I, and so she got excited about it. She didn't feel alone in it. She didn't feel different. Uh, one of the most uh, powerful understandings that I had first and foremost was 
that for a child with dyslexia, they see the letters in 3D. So a B can become a P, an M becomes a W, it's floating. Whereas for a typical reader, you see it, it's, it's on, it's one dimension, right? It's on the page. It's not moving anywhere. So that really helped me understand. And now, um, yeah, I think once I just became informed, you know, often she would try to draw a word and she couldn't, she couldn't recall it. So she would say a word that was associated to it. I didn't understand that until I did the research that that's very common and typical. So um, I think it's just to become informed, be curious, not fearful, and then offer compassion and support because it's really, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, there's so, there's a great support called Made by Dyslexia and um, they have all kinds of information about how they don't use the word superpower, but how it really, it, it's the making of them. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's a lot of support out there. Interesting that you talked about um, approaching challenges with curiosity I- instead of reacting like maybe a lot of parents did when a kid comes home with a bad report card, you know, what's going on here? You're not doing your work, sitting down with your kid and thinking, okay, let's figure this out. Let's be curious. Why, why do you think you're having this challenge? Absolutely. Um, I was actually listening to an interview that Richard Bronson, he's, he's a very um, outspoken about having dyslexia. And he said that, you know, he's British and he was in a boarding school and the teachers at that time didn't understand. I mean, we're also really lucky today that there is an awareness in school systems about differences and that kids need different kinds of help, even if maybe they're not getting it as equally as they should. At least there is uh, a, an understanding or a tolerance. But his um, his principal, his headmaster, used to beat him, like whip him because he, he couldn't understand and he wasn't doing well in school. So I think that... Uh, Always, whether it's dyslexia or anything, if a child is struggling mentally, emotionally, in any way, right, even physically, right, like they're tired or they used to be happy and now they're not, what is going on? Ask the questions. And I think that, of course, for the most part, you know, parents are loving. They they do want to do right by their children. But we sometimes put our fears and even our own feelings of inadequacy from our own childhood on our children. Oh, I don't want them to be bullied because I was bullied in school, or I don't want them to struggle because I struggled and I don't want, I want to save them from that pain. So we just try to make it better or fix it. And I think that's a disservice to the child. Have the conversations and really just ask them how they feel about things. Where are they struggling? How could we support them? What do they need? Uh, Get informed again and, and get information. Um, But I, I think that that's everything in life. When we when we start when we start a- approaching anything with fear, that's the beginning and the end. There's nowhere there's nowhere to grow or move from that. Yeah, it's. I think it's really telling that 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 w- w- what you said about you know we we remember things that happened to us when we were kids, and we don't want our kids to suffer through them, and so we come at that with this fear. Oh, and. It, as you said, it just makes it worse. It makes it worse. And then also what, what are you telling your child, right? What they follow by our own example. If they're seeing something that's hard and they see your reaction is fear, then they become fear-based about it. Mm -hmm. And of course it's not our fault, but it's our responsibility. Yeah. So how do we train ourselves to kind of rise above that uh, trauma that we experience to, kind of let go of that fear and just give our kids the skills to navigate life? Well, I think first you need to have an honest conversation with yourself and deal with your own fear and your own trauma, right? It's the only reason that I became very academic and intellectual um, after I was out of school is because I no longer was willing to believe that lie that I told myself because of that math teacher in fourth grade, even though I was, uh, honestly, I really suffered for that entire year. And it really affected me. And I thought, well, um, I'm bigger than that. And I'm not going to allow him to take any more space. And what proof do I have that I'm not capable, right? It was just one class so many years ago. So I really decided to create a new belief system. So I think first each person has to do their own work to be able to get on the other side of that. And then you can offer it to your child. But if you're still struggling and you're still stuck in that place of pain or trauma, it's going to be very hard to help elevate a child out of it. Yeah. And it's never too late to do that work, by the way. Absolutely. One of the things that we've, we've 
as we've talked about dyslexia uh, here on the podcast, we discovered that there are a number of different things that we can do, that our society can do to help. There's dyslexic-friendly font that could be used in place of, of other font and different types of paper that are, uh, are, are more helpful. There, are there any other tips that we should be aware of? Um, well, there are different um, methods as well. I think being able to draw things out, right? If, if, a, if a person is struggling, just find a different way to show them. It does not have to even be through word, right? It could be through pictures or shortcuts, a lot of shortcuts to create, you know, links between a word and it reminds you of something else. Uh, my daughter goes to Winward. There's a school here in Manhattan, and they also have a school in Connecticut, and they have so many systems in place that um, you could reach out to them, and, and they could share that as well. Um, it's interesting, too, because Abigail and I, as we're promoting our book that just came out on Tuesday, we're writing to different people to see if they can support and help be, you know, advocates for us, and she was writing a letter last night, and she can now recognize when she writes it incorrectly, right? She meant to write an N, she wrote an M. Um, and then at, she, at first she gets, you know, and she's already written, you know, it took her a long time to write seven sentences. She's on the eighth. And I'm like, There's no way, we're not throwing this away. I'm like, it's okay, Abigail. This is the beauty of who you are. It's who you are. And that's how you write. And it's beautiful. So I think a lot of it, of course, there's tools and tips, but I think a lot of it is to help a child accept that this is just part of the way they express themselves. And it's actually quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I would still legible. The person could read it and make sense of it. And if she wanted to redo it, sure. But I, I think it's more about acceptance. Yeah. Accepting ourselves, loving ourselves and loving our kids. Please, Monica, tell us where we can go to find out more about you and find out more about the gift of being different. So you can go to my website. It's called rethinklife.today. You can order your book there. You can order it off of Amazon. Um, you can follow me on social media, media Monica R. Berg uh, 74. And also my husband and I have a podcast called Spiritually Hungry. Wonderful. We've had a wonderful time speaking to the author of The Gift of Being Different, a beautiful picture book from our guest, Monica Berg. Hey, Monica, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We have a very special Halloween treat for you. The authors of a spooky middle grade books are going to be back with an original short story that they created just for the Reading With Your Kids podcast. You don't want to miss it. This is always a lot of fun. I really look forward to this every year. The next episode, Spooky Middle Grade Authors, special Halloween short story just for you. Hey, if you would like to connect with us, there are so many ways, and we would love to connect with you. On social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram and TikTok. We have a great Pinterest page. We also are on Twitter at Jedly Magic. Be sure to check out our YouTube page, Reading With Your Kids. And we would love it if you could join us on our website, readingwithyourkids.com. You can click on the contact button at the top of the page to let us know what we're doing right. Let us know what we could be doing better. Let us know who you would like to hear on a future episode of the show. You can also sign up for our free online magazine. That's all at readingwithyourkids.com. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, Monica Byrne. Thank you so much for introducing us to the gift of being different. Also want to thank our sponsors, Janet Hoffman. How can we be kind? Wisdom from the animal kingdom. And also Janie Emmaus, her great award-nominated book, Latkes for Santa Claus. I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q, Jordan Saley, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading With Your Kids Podcast. <laughs>